stories or do stories tell us? Do they live in books or do stories live in trees and rocks and in the sound of water rippling over stones? Wherever you live, it's quite possible there are stories under your feet that you do not know. I live in upstate New York in North America, and today we're going to explore some of the stories right here in this place. In particular, we're going to look at the creation story as told by the Seneca people of the northeastern United States. And we're also going to talk with Michelle Seneca of the Gaiocono community here in upstate New York. Thank you for joining me, and let us begin. All right. Hello and welcome to the Crane Bag Podcast. I'm Jay Leeming, and we're going to explore some stories today. And we're going to look at culture as well. Um, Story lives in people. It lives in the earth as well. As I said, wherever you live in the world, there are probably stories right under your feet that you do not know. Here in North America, that situation is uh, especially complicated. Well, it's complicated lots of places. But here, I feel the uh, gap, the distance between uh, this city I live in, which is called Ithaca, named for a Greek city, of course, and the land itself, which has stories in it which seem very far from me. That is my experience. Uh, It's how I feel. I don't know all these stories either, Um, but we come to this country, right? Or we came, our uh, forebears did, in my case, Norwegians, Germans, and English folks, came to America, and they brought with them, what did they bring? They brought Christianity. They brought some uh, so-called pagan stories, like little seeds caught in their coats that they didn't know were there, Norse myth, Celtic stuff. And they came to this place, Turtle Island, North America, And there are stories here um, all around us. Um, And we're going to begin, actually, by just saying hello. Uh, I live in Ithaca, New York, uh, Finger Lakes region of New York State. And that is the territory of the Gaiocono. You may know them as the Cayuga. uh, The Cayuga of the Iroquois, but they would prefer to be known as the Gaiocono of the Haudenosaunee. So how you say hello in the Gaiocono language is scano. You say scano, which means peace, it means harmony, it means well-being. And it can also be a question. Uh, How are you well? You can say scano. Um, So here is a short dialogue, real brief, of two people talking in Gaiocono, saying, hello, how you doing? Hi, hi, scano, okay? Aha, scano. Dendi, nice. Aha, scano. Teho dan shaso? Mary gaso. Nendi, nice. So that's two people talking, uh, saying basically, hello, how are you? Uh, I'm good, how are you? And then, uh, what is your name? My name is Mary. Uh, What is your name? My name is Joe. And uh, I'll see you later. That's basically what they're saying. This was the language that uh, continues to be spoken today, uh, but historically was spoken in the Uh, Finger Lakes region, in particular around Cayuga Lake in the Finger Lakes region for thousands of years. If you uh, had gone to Seneca Lake, you would have found a different language than this. Let's hear this little dialogue one more time. Hi, hi. Scano, okay? Aha, scano. Dendi, nice. Aha, scano. Teho dan shaso? Mary gaso. Nendi, nice. Joe gaso. This conversation comes from the Speak Cayuga app, which is from Thornton Media Incorporated, and you can get it uh, for free and put it on your phone. So I grew up here in this town, and I have never heard any of those words. 
I knew other words from other languages, like kindergarten, a German word, which has entered our vocabulary. Sushi, I know that word. Uh, tortilla, burrito, those Spanish words. Uh, all kinds of words from other places entered my vocabulary. But these words, scano, uh, <laughs> scano, those didn't enter my vocabulary. Again, it's a culture right here, and most of us who are descended from European Americans are uh, blind to it. Um, in my town, people have um, prayer flags, Tibetan prayer flags, often on their porches. I myself have had Tibetan prayer flags on my porch, and that's a wonderful and a beautiful thing. That's a culture that is under threat, and it's a beautiful culture, and it is a right and a good thing that we support the Tibetans and their culture. Um, but that's on the other side of the planet. Uh, there's a culture here which we know even less about. And the main reason that we don't know about this culture is, of course, the Sullivan Campaign of 1779. Uh, General Sullivan uh, was sent to the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York by George Washington. And uh, he was sent with the express purpose of destroying the Haudenosaunee. Um, we can quote. Should we quote? Yes. Here is a letter from uh, orders, actually, from George Washington to General John Sullivan in 1779, in which he says, uh, the immediate object, the expedition you are appointed to command is to be directed against the hostile tribes of the Six Nations of Indians with their associates and adherents. The immediate objects are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops now in the ground and prevent their planting more. I would recommend that some post in the center of the Indian country should be occupied with all expedition, with a sufficient quantity of provisions, whence parties should be detached to lay waste all the settlements around, with instructions to do it in the most effectual manner, that the country may not be merely overrun, but destroyed. He goes on to say there, there will be no negotiations until the total ruinment of their settlements is effected. So that can be a lot to take in if, uh, like myself, you grew up in this area. Um, the government, the federal government spent 85% of its budget that year on destroying the Haudenosaunee. Catch that. Take that in. 85% of the federal budget of the United States in 1779 was spent destroying the Haudenosaunee. And uh, they largely succeeded. They burned their villages and uh, captured many people, killed others. And those that were left went to Canada, to a place which is since uh, near Grand River, since been called the Six Nations uh, Reserve Reservation. Uh, the Haudenosaunee had about a thousand peach trees on the shore of Cuga Lake. All of those were set on fire. So that's part of the history. That's a glimpse of the history in this place of the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. And in some sense, it's no wonder we do not know more. It's no, cause of, no, it's, it's no wonder that we are blind to this history. But if we're going to walk on this earth uh, in a full way with open hearts and minds, if we're going to really be where we are in this place that we call North America, uh, we should be alive and awake to what is here now uh, in every sense and what has been here before. The Gaio Kono in the recently have returned to the Finger Lakes region, and we will talk about that later, particularly in a discussion with Michelle Seneca of the Gaio Kono community. We're going to take a very short musical break and then return and explore the creation story of the Haudenosaunee, particularly through a Seneca version of that story. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back to the Crane Bag Podcast. I am Jay Leeming. Today, right now, we're going to look at the creation story of the Haudenosaunee, particularly as uh, carried on, as preserved by the Seneca people of the Haudenosaunee. And I'm going to do an unusual thing for me. I'm going to read you some of this story. Yeah, I'm going to read it. I mean, I'm all about the words that fly like birds and live and die and have their existence in the moment. But in this case, this is a very sacred story. It is foreign to my ancestry. I do not know a lot about it. And um, I want to walk carefully around this story. Um, There are secret things in this story. Um, There's no question about that, that I cannot perceive and that anyone outside the culture from which it comes uh, would have a hard time seeing. In some sense, every story is like that. A Norse myth is probably like that. The Greek myths are probably like that. Stories we think we know and we do know in some sense, they have secret things in them that only the people deep in that culture would know. So as a storyteller, I just feel less comfortable you know, just telling this one, um, because I might change something that is very crucial without knowing it. So I'm going to read you a little bit of a version of this story, um, as written down by a fellow named J.N.B. Hewitt. Um, The story was told by John Arthur Gibson, a chief of the Seneca, who was born in 1850, uh, died in 1912. This version was told by him. This story is kept alive uh, in the people, by repeated retellings uh, every year, Uh, tellings of the story which take uh, a while. It's not a story you tell in five minutes. Uh, You may know this story a little bit uh, in terms of the sky woman who falls from the sky and the turtle uh, on which she, uh, she lives. But describing it like that, it's a little bit like describing the Odyssey as, well, it's about a guy who comes home from a war or war and peace. It's about Russia. Uh, Those statements aren't false, but they are not even the doorstep of the house we wish to enter, we wish to enter. So in any case, this story was told by the Seneca chief, John Arthur Gibson, to an ethnographer, an anthropologist, a linguist named J.N.B. Hewitt who was uh, part Tuscarora, born on the Tuscarora Reservation. And he did an amazing thing, which is he wrote this story down word for word. The Grimm's brothers in the 19th century in Germany uh, didn't do that exactly. Or if they did, the versions they published were then changed by them and uh, put into a form that you could read easily. But Mr. Hewitt wrote down this story word for word, um, which is quite an amazing thing. Uh, in the Seneca language, of course. Um, Then it's been translated uh, by Hewitt uh, in sort of old, older English. Hewitt was born in 1859. And then there's a version version by John C. Mohawk, a Seneca uh, activist and great teacher who was born in 1945, died in 2006. And he has written a dissertation uh, about this story, uh, just bringing it into more or less contemporary language. And that's called The Vision of Turtle Island. So uh, this story is coming through many voices and personalities and hearts and souls, uh, including me, uh, to get to you, dear listener. Um, but in most of these folks along the trail, uh, are from the culture. I'm the one who's not, and that's why I'm going to read it, uh, for you. And we're not going to get that far, but we're going to give you a sense. This story is, um, 164 pages long in the John C. Mohawk, Mohawk version. 164 pages long. So there's a lot in it. The uh, Guy Okono faith keeper, Stephen Henhawk, uh, has said that this story provides more questions than answers. And at least for me, that's definitely the case. Um, I should say Guy Okono is how the Cayuga people wish to be called. Cayuga is not really their name. Uh, Guy Okono is, in fact, their name. Um, in any case, let us begin. Let us try to welcome this story, even as we are here. Story, we welcome you to this place and to our hearts, to this moment in the airspace, the radio waves, the space, the time, the moment in which we inhabit and we breathe. We welcome you to this place. And even as we see you, perhaps, 
as a traveler who has come a long way, hiking through continents like translations, coming with dust on your boots, and perhaps having had little to eat for a long time, we know in fact that we are the travelers, and you in fact are the one welcoming us. For we live in and about and among you all the time. We live on this continent, North America. We live amidst your story. And so, in fact, we are the ones coming who are poor. We are the ones coming with dust on our shoes and having had little to eat. We come hiking to the doorway of you, O story, hoping to be sheltered by you and to learn and to be nourished by your gifts. We hope to listen for a brief while at your door. All right, then. The Vision of Turtle Island. It happened in ancient times that he tosses skies about, the ancient man, undertook to create conditions which would bring spiritual power to his sister's two young children, a boy and a girl. It was a custom that spiritual powers came to those who had been concealed from society, and the old man took the children and kept them in a hiding place where no one would see them. So I'm going to break in here and explain and talk because that's just the way it is. Uh, what a great name for a god, huh? He tosses skies about. What's your name? He tosses skies about is my name, the ancient man. And then we get uh, this idea of spiritual seclusion. Uh, the spiritual power is going to come from seclusion, which is very interesting when you think of other stories like Rapunzel uh, or uh, Sleeping Beauty in a way where a young person is uh, held and uh, kept constrained. And uh, in this story, we're saying that's because it'll bring spiritual power to his sister's two young children. So anyway, all right, here we go. Let's do it again, huh? It happened in ancient times that he tosses skies about. The ancient man undertook to create conditions which would bring spiritual power to his sister's two young children, a boy and a girl. It was a custom that spiritual powers came to those who had been concealed from society and the old man took the children and kept them in a hiding place where no one would see them. No one will ever see you in your childhood, he told them, and therefore you will possess goodness of mind. Not until you have grown to manhood and womanhood will you mingle with the people. In time, however, the uncle returned with a message. I am suffering because of past injuries and ill fortunes directed at me, and I must soon pass away. When I am gone, take my body and place it at the top of the highest tree. If some trouble should ever happen and you need to hear my voice again, it will be possible to do so. The girl, grown to a young woman, began to cry. How can I do that, uncle? I can't climb the highest tree. You can if you must, he replied. The old man then went to his sister, ancient woman, the mother of the two children. I am leaving everything to you, he said. You must treat the children well because they are children of destiny. You shall not hear my voice again until after their destiny is completed. Then the old man fell silent. An illness overcame him, and soon he was dead. The three survivors followed the instructions. The mother of the children fashioned a bark coffin, and the young man then took the body and coffin and carried it aloft to the top of the highest pine tree where he laid the body to rest. She then continued as the ancient man had instructed and concealed her son and daughter as before. Soon a man approached her lodge. Where is your family gone, he asked. They are absent, she replied. I have come to you as a matter of great urgency. Our leader, earth holder, he who is, he has a standing tree, sent me with a message that you are summoned to him. Now tell me when your family will return. It is possible that we are all to receive a revelation from the ancient man, and it is possible that no one should repeat what ancient man has said to the keeper of the standing tree. We know, you and I, that your family has begun to visit ancient man. I don't know what I should do. Ancient man lies at the top of the tree, and my children are in seclusion. It is possible that they are included in the thing that is desired by Hodahe. That's the name for he has a standing tree. Then the stranger departed. As soon as he was gone, ancient woman heard her daughter crying. She cried for a long time. Perhaps, ancient woman began, you would like to see ancient man. I can't climb the tree. I can carry you there, her brother replied. He carried her aloft to where the uncle was tied to the tree and they removed the bark. When she saw his face once again, a peace came over her mind. Then they returned to earth. 
Soon the stranger returned to the lodge to speak to Ancient Woman. Your family are the only people who have not come to the place where our leader is giving his feast. It is necessary that at least one of you come so that the chief will be pleased. Who is it that have gone there? Ancient Woman asked. You should go and find out. Then you can talk with him. All right, let's do that. Woman and the stranger then went to the lodge of the chief. When they arrived, the stranger said, I have brought this woman here as you asked. She is the mother of the children you wish to attend your feast. Everyone, all who live here, have attended the feast, the chief began. But none of your family have come. I think you are very powerful. I think you have the power to tell me what is on my mind. Who is it then, ancient woman asked, who has come to this place? All have visited here, he answered. The sun and the moon the star and the tree, the bush and the grass, the animals and the birds, the springs of water and the flowing waters, and the light and the clouds and the corn, beans, and the squashes. The tobacco plant has come, and the night and the daylight, the thunders and the water have come, and the comet has come, and the blue sky as well, and also the air. And this is why you have come. There is only one lacking. Of all those who have been here, the wind has not come. I also desire that one will come who will reveal my will. I will probably th thrust through the ground all the things of this world, and I will do this because of all these things have failed to aid me in this world. When this happens, new things will come forth, and this world will be renewed. All right, well, let me just break in here a moment, and uh, let's try to get a handle on what's happening in this story. We've got Ancient Man, who also has the name He Tosses Skies About. And then we've got Ancient Woman, and she has two children, one who's named Mature Blossoms, or uh, Hewitt says Mature Earth, Fertile Earth, and a boy named Earthquake. All of these people are not really people. They're, this is all happening in the sky world. So it's a realm uh, beyond our own. It's an other world. Uh, they are gods, we might say. Um, so there's Ancient Man. He dies, and they put him up in a tree in a coffin, a bark coffin. And there is ancient woman who has two children, a boy and a girl. The girl, Mature Blossoms, and the boy named Earthquake. And then there's this guy, Hodahe, also called Earth Holder, also called, called He Has a Standing Tree. And um, he is having a feast in which he's going to renew all the things of this world. So right away, um, I... I quoted uh, Stephen Henhawk, the faith keeper of the Gaiokono, who uh, said this story has more questions than answers. And I feel that way, certainly. Um, the sky world needs to be renewed. That's pretty amazing, huh? Uh, a lot of our Western beliefs have another world which is more or less permanent, uh, whether you call that heaven in the Christian world or whether... Um, I don't know, some Celtic conceptions of the other world. The Greek conception, I guess. Um, there's another world. The gods live there, and it doesn't change much. Now, of course, the Norse myths are uh, an exception to that, because in that, uh, the gods live and they die. But here it is sort of interesting that the sky world needs to be renewed, and the word renewed is used almost as if it's a cyclical thing. Perhaps there's a seasonal thing up there, which is pretty, pretty fascinating. Also, this list of things which have come to Hodahe, Earth Holder, is pretty amazing. So that's, for me, the first sense I get that, whoa, this is uh, kind of a, this is more than just a party. This is a feast with a ritual significance. Because he says the sun and the moon have come to this feast, the star and the tree, the bush and the grass, the animals and the birds, the springs of water and the flowing waters, and the light and the clouds and the corn, beans and squashes the tobacco plant and the night and the daylight, the thunders and the water and the comet and the blue sky and the air. They have all come. He says only one is lacking and the wind has not come. Um, so it's a pretty interesting wild tapestry, this, this story. And um, I will just read you a little bit more so we can get into it here. Because then he says, uh, earth holder, uh, he who has a tree, says, uh, two mature blossoms. And this is why you have come. There is only one lacking. Of all those who have been here, the wind has not come. I also desire that one will come who will reveal my will. I will probably thrust through the ground all the things of this world. And I will do this because all of these things have failed to aid me in this world. 
When this happens, new things will come forth, and this world will be renewed. It will not be long, ancient woman replied, before my two children will come forward and will try to reveal your vision. Of course, my children are still quite young. So, sorry, I made a mistake there, but that's ancient woman speaking to Hodahe, earth holder, he who has a tree. And she says her children are going to come and reveal his vision. Uh, of course, my children are still quite young, she says. That is all right, Hodahe, earth holder, said. I will wait. Look now at the standing tree. All its blossoms are in bloom, and until the blossoms fall off, this, my feast, will continue. The only thing that keeps everything in good order is that those enjoying themselves must keep things interesting and entertaining for me. Ancient woman returned to her lodge. So I hope you can see this is a very complex and uh, fascinating story uh, with many nuances and secret things in it. Um, and it's a story that was told in uh, upstate New York for thousands of years and continues to be told, continues to nourish the uh, Haudenosaunee people, the Gaokono people. But we're going to stop here uh, and move on, uh, take a short break, and come back in a little bit and talk with Michelle Seneca of the Gaokono community. Stay with us. Some time ago, I spoke with Michelle Seneca of the Gaiocono community of upstate New York. We talked about the Gaiocono way of life, uh, the history of their people, and the current state of things here uh, for the Gaiocono. I began by asking her about storytelling and its place in Gaiocono life, and she had this to say. I think a lot of it is like, even when we're, um, like, say when we're planting you know, there could be a story that goes with that particular seed that you're putting into the ground, you know, that goes back way back in history, you know. So I think that's pretty amazing because I never heard stuff like that when I've been in the culture class and things out here on the territory. So when I hear those stories, um, they're pretty um I don't know. I, I really like it. I, I like um, how it just tie, uh, it all ties together and it helps you understand how um, it how the land, how you relate to the land. Cool. And maybe I should back up. Uh, you grew up in uh, Six Nations, Canada or in Seneca Falls? I grew up on the Cataraugus Indian Reservation mm -hmm. over in um, the Seneca Nation. Yeah, that's where I grew up. And then I came back to the Cayuga Territory in 2010. Gotcha. A uh, story fits into the, the world in terms of stories about seeds and things like that. Um, are there stories for lots of different parts of life, would you say? Like the seasons and stuff like that? There is. There's like storytelling with everything, actually. Like mm -hmm. every, um, right down to like, you know, our ceremonies and our way of life, our, like, even just specifically for, like, the men, specifically for the women, specifically for the little girls, specifically for the little boys. So growing up, the kids hear a lot of stories. Yeah, and, like, it's neat now, like, now that I hear um, things and stuff from listening, and now I'm able to, like, help, like, my nieces and, you know, my, my kids so they can help their kids, and mm -hmm. so that's pretty neat. Are there certain people you would say who are like storytellers, like above and beyond, or is everybody, are the stories kind of known to everybody in the community? No, I wouldn't say like, like everybody out here that's coming, that came back to the territory is um, basically we all, we, a lot of us came from the Cataraugus reservation. So we knew we adapted to the Seneca Nation. So we heard their stories. We heard their songs. We heard their language. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Um, And now when we've come back here, now we're like identifying like who actually we are and the way that we're identifying and being able to get tied back to our land, our homeland is, um, you know, these traditions and the culture and, um, you know, how it re- how we all relate to the land. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I knew that I was Gaia Kono, but I was thankful and grateful that I was like, at least, you know, being exposed to some type of language and some type of culture. And, so that's something which um, you're, you've obviously uh, learned by living it. But for um, a lot of the listeners and certainly myself growing up, uh, I wasn't aware that Seneca Lake was a different culture in many ways from Cayuga Lake. So that, that amazes me in a different, a related but a different language as well, correct? Correct. Yeah. Are there stories which fit into this place? Yeah. Well, just from like what I understood from listening to like well I mean it fits for me because the stories that I'm hearing like I can see it like you know I mm-hmm. but like if I were to hear this like say if I lived still back in the Seneca Nation and I'm hearing these stories because they're talk the, they would be talking about you know the geographical this geographical part and that's way different than where I grew up because I'm going to hear this and I'm going to be like, well, where is it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You yeah. know, where is it? I don't see it, but, mm-hmm. you know, but we're putting, you know, we're, we're still putting our songs and stuff, you know, singing them and, and things like that. And like this in through your language, cause it's so descriptive and mm-hmm. it's like, well, like I, you know, I would probably ask a lot of questions myself, you know, mm-hmm. but like I said, I adapted to the Seneca nation. So that's how I understood now how every nation culturally identifies and ties to their land and it's through their language and their, you know, because it's describing their geographics and where they belong. That's that, you know, your homeland. So, I mean, to be honest, I feel a little fortunate, I guess, that I was able to learn it and experience it all together. And so were my children, actually, you know, they didn't get exposed to this Cayuga language until they, till we came here. So they're hearing Cayuga stories and they're living sort of close enough, either in, in Seneca Falls, for example, where they can see where those stories happen. Yeah, right. Yeah, so they can see it. And then like, and that, and it helps to, you know, like with through, um, our cultural teacher here too he can like you know he knows where these geographical spots are and what and through the language you know and then you can like see it and identify it and you know mm-hmm. so that's pretty for and it, and what's really neat i like is that the kids that have been born on the territory now are really tied to this land mm-hmm. you know because this is all they know you know mm-hmm. they weren't born anywhere else but here so if somebody is in Ithaca and goes to a place like Taganic Waterfall or just goes to the lake. Um, from what you're saying, I would understand there are stories about those places which are alive in the Gaokono culture. Is that true? Yeah. How do you feel about outsiders learning the stories of the Gaokono culture? Are some stories more um, sacred and more, more just for the culture or are some to be shared with others, do you think? Um, yeah, there are stories that can be shared with others. And I mean, it goes both ways. You know, there are things too that we are going to keep, you know, that are handed down. I mean, and that can go through families or whatever, you know. And um, so there, it, it, it does go both ways. So just one question. I, I know a little bit of, um, in European stories a lot, the other world is up there all the time. Uh, whether it's the Norse gods or the Greeks, all the magic is up there and we're down here on earth um from what little i know of the sky woman story i would just ask is that a similar view in the gaio kono world or not so much uh i'm thinking of myself when i'm 10 years old and i'm wondering where the magic is and i was told in the stories it was up there um but um, yeah 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 that's how that's how I, because like, I never really, um, like now that I'm identifying myself more and more, mm-hmm. and now I even look at that like way different from where I grew up in the Seneca, you know, I always knew a sky world, but mm-hmm. 
like I, I look at it differently now that I'm culturally identifying and, you know, speaking my language here, you know, yeah. so, but yeah, it, and now it's even more, um, it's even more magic. <laughs> uh -huh. Did you get a lot of, uh, I don't know what else to call them, American stories as a kid, like TV and stuff like that, like everybody else? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did um, get a lot of that. And then, um, like, growing up, too, like, um, my um, like my father, he was Seneca, and he could speak in that, but he never taught us. Mm -hmm. And he also, though, he was one of the ones, he went to a residential school right there on the territory. There's the Thomas Indian School, and it's right located right on the reservation. And mm -hmm. he was, like, one of the last ones that went there, then he had to go to like high school, transferred into high school. And then from there got drafted right into the Marines. Mm -hmm. So for him, you know, so sometimes now that I'm learning who I am, I sometimes I'm like, geez, I want to go back and realize like, yeah, I should have, I, I understand now why he was, I guess, the way he was, you know, and why he, you know, I, it's not for me to, um, I guess, hold so much harshness <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah on yeah, him yeah. you know because he came from a different you know he came from a different time frame and so i didn't get that storytelling like that mm -hmm. from him you right. know i didn't get it and i got some a little bit from my grand from my um my grandma my um mm -hmm. my guy Kono grandma i got mm -hmm. i got that how did it feel to come back to the uh the homeland Oh, it was like, um, I guess it was very different because I didn't, um, I didn't know what this whole checkerboarding was. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't understand that because I'm coming from a whole reservation of like, you know, that my, like on my non-native neighbors, like they have their, ter you know, their, their part and we had our part. Yeah. And now I'm like, how are we living? Like, how does this all work? And how does, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I had, that was like really something to get used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mean the way the land was divided up? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it was like a native family, then a non-native and maybe another native, you know, like that. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, and then one of the things too, coming back is like, um, um, when you would see those signs, there was a lot of signs around here that said no reservation and no sovereign, you know, nation. Mm -hmm. And um, so it kind of made me a little bit um, guarded yeah. <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. But um, but at the same time, I was like, well, we got to be friendly too. I was mm -hmm. like, because we got to let them know that we're here to like help them maintain the land, mm -hmm. you know, and then that's basically what my goal, I guess, was at and what we're still trying to strive for, Yeah, you know, so to get, you know, not only culturally identifying and learning our own language and, mm -hmm. um, but also learning how to be good neighbors. Yeah. How, how young were you, I guess, when you understood about the Sullivan campaign, for example, and the way the, the Gaokona were kicked off of their land? Was that something you grew up with or was that later? At, that was later, but I would hear about how it would go through the Seneca Nation. I heard mm -hmm. about all that, yeah. you know, because like they were, I grew up over there. So every time we had heard about the Sullivan thing was all geared towards, you know, the, Sel the Seneca Nation villages and stuff, you know. Yeah. So I heard a lot about like that part of it. Right. But then when I came here and then actually hearing it from not out of a textbook and not out of uh you know like what i heard in school or something but actually hearing like from stories and stuff that were handed down yeah. over the years and things and mm -hmm. that um it's like wow you know like wow i didn't know i didn't know it was like that because it's i guess that was kind of me too like i i want i um i knew that i was gaia kono but i was listening to the senecas and then i'm I mean, I'm very intrigued and want to learn, but at the same time as I'm listening, I'm processing thoughts of like, where was my land? Where were we doing? Where was I? Where how? Where did my 
did my grandma run all the way over here? Is that why I'm still alive and mm, <laughs> why yeah. I'm still here? And I, you know, trying to identify as Guy Pono, right. <laughs> you know, like what happened? So I would always like feel like, oh, I have listen because I'm sitting there trying to worry about like, you know, well, where was I or where were my people? And mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard the traditional Gaokono society is matriarchal. Uh, can you tell us something about this? Yeah, well, um, like the women out here, we would um, hold like the, you know, the titles and stuff to the land. And but the clan mother would like oversee all of that. You know, mm -hmm. she would make sure that that gets the lands are all handed out, you know, through your through your titles and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um. But it is, it's for, because, you know, we're the ones that give life and we're the ones that, you know, earth. And so we also, um, the clan mothers, they make the decision of who's going to be chief. Mm -hmm. You know, they make that selection process, mm -hmm. you know, and if there's issues that are, coming then you know or if anybody has big issues maybe has some before council is going to happen clan meetings would happen and that clan would discuss and take it to you know the chief is just the voice you know the clan mother would oversees everything but that chief is going to represent you know the entire clan and their voice mm. and this historically made a big impression on the european okay. americans right when they came and they ran into the Haudenosaunee, it was like it had a big mm -hmm. impact on American democracy. Yes, yeah, that's how I see it too. I'm like, yeah, look, they developed or they took our democracy, but they just maybe didn't like the women part of it, you know, mm -hmm. and put the man in charge instead and not the woman because, yeah. you know, it's just opposite. Right. <laughs> Historically, uh, just to bring our listeners up to speed, there have been conflicts in North America between those uh, in the Native communities who have been chosen by the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to receive federal money and those who have refused that money uh, so as to preserve their traditional ways. In February of 2020, uh, 12 buildings, I believe it is, were, were demolished, bulldozed, uh, among them a school and a daycare uh, a garden, a community garden. Uh, these were all destroyed, and this came out of the conflict between those in the community who receive the, the federal money and those who do not. Can you help us uh, understand uh, what happened then and what the situation is around this? Um, yeah, I can. So on um, February 22nd, um, Clint Halftown and um, his council made a decision to um, demolish some buildings over here in Seneca Falls, which um, as we were, um, we're under the chiefs and the clan mothers, our, um, our true traditional form of government, mm -hmm. which um, are comprised of 10 chiefs mm -hmm. and um, each each chief has their um their clan mother. Anyways, he took these buildings down. He took a cigarette fact or a cigarette um business down, a store, a daycare that we had for the families out here that were either um working on or off or maybe pursuing they were gonna pursue education or whatever. And anyways, their daycare was there for them. And then we had the schoolhouse, um, which we were, everybody had been learning their um, language and their culture. And um, then we also were, um, you know, doing um, like our ceremonies, things like that, mm -hmm. and holding social gatherings. And so he took all of that down and he took down the canning building and he took down the ice cream factory. Mm -hmm or the ice cream um, stand and it was um it was really like um heartbreaking to see that he would do that i mean um to see the schoolhouse i guess go down because he knew what that building was mm -hmm. and he um 
it's like, why would you want to um, destroy your own, um, you know, your own culture? That's what it felt like. That's what it feels like to us over here. Mm -hmm. It's like, why would you want to like stop your language from continuing and being revitalized? Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of myself, a lot of conversations with Flint Pride and Seneca Falls, but this whole battle has been going on for 20 years. Mm. And, you know, just I've only lived 10 of it, but it, it was going on 10 years prior to that. Mm. And um, now it's just escalated to, to me, like he's, um, you know, he doesn't like, why don't I, he does, he doesn't want it. I don't know why he don't want it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what was also really um disheartened was seeing how he um destroyed the whole garden mm -hmm. you know he bulldozed that down as well mm -hmm. and um that's who we are that's who you know that's who we are we you know we have our planting and we have our mm -hmm. had our language and you know we were we were just trying to survive mm -hmm. that's all mm -hmm. and just be alone you know mm -hmm. i was like we weren't doing you know he didn't want to talk to us how many times have we asked him mm -hmm. in the beginning to talk and he would not yeah you know but he ran off with federal recognition and mm -hmm. it's just not what you know you can't do that you know i know that's not our traditional government mm -hmm. you know you want to be traditional when it benefits and then you want to turn around and utilize you know your outside people too when it's convenient yeah you know and to me that's like no you don't do that you don't use people like both both sides mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. and you said this struggle has been going on for 20 years about yeah yep mm -hmm. it's been going on since the 80s it's been going on since the land claims were um mm -hmm. getting um well actually when nixon went and um said that we could um have the self-determination act mm -hmm. you know for the Indian nation, you know, mm -hmm. then we could go in and pursue our land claims. Yeah. And that's when we put in for, you know, to put the land claim in for, for here. And mm -hmm. it was finally settled in like what, 2001 or no, three maybe or two, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it took quite a while for it to get settled. Mm hmm. And that settlement, um, was uh in your favor but didn't result in anything happening is that true yeah well what happened was that too is um i remember after land claim we won because mm -hmm. we get these newsletters and i would get my newsletter and i was reading it and i was like oh look we actually won our res back over there i guess and to me now being like a majority of the Cayugas that are on this side of the border, the United States border, there's only like 500, a little over 500. Mm -hmm. There's only that much. Over on the other side in Canada, there's like approximately 2,000. Mm -hmm. So over here, we're just like a, a small amount, I feel like. And mm -hmm. a lot of us over here were spread out across the United States, mm -hmm. you know, so... Now we're trying to come back and identify and self-identify and come back and learn who we are after identifying for where we were born the last, you know, depending on our age. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And after we won that land claim and um, there was talks of a casino that was going to be going up in the Adirondacks and the Catskills. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where a, um, they were going to put that through and then um, it ended up not going because of course the council started fighting mm -hmm. Clint, Tim, Gary, mm -hmm. you know, they all started fighting and um, they had the people that I think they were going to like go with or whatever they must, I don't, they must've backed off. But it, mm -hmm. any, I just remember getting a newsletter saying that like it fell through, you mm -hmm. know, so that was no longer a goal. Yeah. So, um, we ended up start well i know then eventually he he was out here from what i understand like back in like oh four maybe or oh five when he got the smoke shops going you know the stores over here in seneca falls 
you know, up and running. And then um, we came, what, maybe five years later. Mm-hmm. That's when we came out, you know, and we were put out here, I believe, for, um, it was like the final parts of the land into trust application, you know, you going to put your land into trust. I'm sure you need, you know, your people there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I'm like, well, yeah, you know, so, but then that turned into, a, um, you know what it was when we first moved back here, the people that came, we were so thirsty to know who we were. Mm-hmm. Where's our language? Where, where's our school? Are we going to have one? They were saying, you know, where, where's our language and school? And he showed us this bookcase and everybody was like, what? We don't want this. And that kind of just went back and forth. And it was like, what's Cayuga law? I'm like, you have your security trucks coming out. I'm like, so what's the law? Like, where's our laws? You know, I was like, I know what it's like in the Seneca Nation. Yeah, they have a constitution. They got a Mm -hmm. police department. and But we're not Seneca Nation. We're Cayuga Nation. (laughs) You know, so I'm like, so what's us? I think we just asked too many questions and he didn't like it. And then he started shutting, basically shutting us out. Mm -hmm. And we didn't like that because we were like, no, you didn't take us from where we were to bring us out here. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know to, we need help you know we're trying to adapt into our new environment you know mm-hmm. and I'm like and my neighbor like is like not like my is not somebody I know you know mm-hmm. like on the reservation everybody knows everybody you know your neighbors 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 yeah. neighbors <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. so and over here I'm like I feel really super alone <laughs> so uh so just, just just to break it down, this is a conflict between the the folks who get the federal money in the in the Gaiocono community and the folks who don't, more or less, right? Because he's the Bureau of Indian Affairs guy. Just, just for the listeners, yeah, he it, is. He's the um, he's yeah. He takes the federal f- funds from mm-hmm. the um. For on behalf of the guy, um, the Cuban nation, the guy, Kono, but yeah. he's doing that illegally because he was never authorized by his clan mother to be doing that. Mm-hmm. And he'll still claim Haudenosaunee, which, you know, were traditional five nations, mm-hmm. you know, he'll still claim that. Mm-hmm. So that's where he'll use, um, you know, like when he wants to be traditional, mm-hmm. he'll use that. But when he wants to get federal funding, okay, now I'm going to go over and follow USA and, you know, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, no, we have our own laws and we have our own way. And, you know, you shouldn't take that from the kids, you know, because a lot was already taken from plenty of us. (laughs) I'm like, so when's it going to stop? You know, you got to like stop and just think about those kids and, the ones that aren't even, you know, here yet, you know, because I have grandkids myself. So now I'm like, oh my gosh, what about not just who's living here, but my youngest granddaughter right now to like, okay, what about her youngest granddaughter? Mm -hmm. You know, I got to look that far. Yeah. 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 You talk about the hunger to um, know who you, to, to connect with the culture. Um, Is that hunger pretty strong still today? Oh yeah. Yeah, it is because then I got pretty like involved in learning this time as we were proceeding in court because we did win a court case over here in October Mm -hmm. um, of 2019 where Mm -hmm. Clint was trying to actually evict us over here from our homes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why would you want to do that? That's repeating history. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, what people witnessed over and saw during that protest where the chiefs and you know some clan mothers were there and the tradition you know a lot of traditional people were there but a lot of us I know I got activated in me I was like um oh my god I thought about Sullivan when Sullivan came through and that's generational trauma and they triggered that and Clint triggered that in us I was like he triggered our generational trauma from Sullivan's campaign And I'm like, that's shame on him. He should not do that. And he utilized, like, 
people that we look like felt, you know, that we, that was triggered through our generational trauma, yeah. you know, that it's been handed down and handed down and handed mm -hmm. down for generations, mm -hmm. you know, and then it takes, look at me, I'm in my forties now and I'm just understanding it now and able to look at my parents now and like, okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, it's like, we got to stop the generational stuff, but it's hard, you know? Yeah. After all that has happened, uh, what are your thoughts about the future? Well, I still, you know, I try to remain optimistic, but mm -hmm. there's just never a dull moment. And when Clint Halftown got denied his land into trust application, mm -hmm. you know, and a majority of her decision, um, Tara Sweeney, who is the um, Department of Interior for the BIA, she, um, you know, came made that decision and a lot of it was based on the day of that protest mm -hmm. you know a lot of her decision came from that mm -hmm. so clint halftone you know he doesn't like no for mm -hmm. he doesn't like no for an answer so mm -hmm. <laughs> he tends to retaliate yeah. Yeah. you know and i'm i'm happy that i can like at least have some kind of humor i guess but Mm -hmm. At the same time, I don't want to live in like constant, um, constant wonder because I did that for the first couple years when we first, this community out here, I was like, like I said, I came in 2010, I was one of the first 10 families to come back to the territory. Mm. And I remember doing this big article with Finger Lakes and, you know, they said after 200 years, the first wave of Cayugas are moving back, you know, mm. and um, now I'm just like, I don't want to live in like, like, I'm going to get chased off again, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm like, it took me 200 years to get back here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I don't want to like give up just like that. And mm -hmm. I don't want to live in constant fear either. So uh, my people can adapt and we've learned how to adapt, but I got to learn how to do a lot of things all at once, you know, but yeah. mm -hmm. I don't want to, um, I still want to stay positive and I still want to like work with who we are, you know, our traditional government, our traditional ways, our traditional, because it was working prior, mm -hmm. you know, it was working all good prior yeah. to, you know, what we've become. Yeah. Yeah. I said, we just got to pick up the broken pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if folks not in the Gaiokono community wish to help, there is a GoFundMe campaign, right? Yes. Yes, there is. There's a GoFundMe campaign going on right now that can be found on the um what is that the Ithaca Primaculture down there and um it you go on there and there's a link to it but mm -hmm. there is a GoFundMe and we're still trying to fundraise to culturally revitalize our efforts here because we're not giving up we mm -hmm. still put a garden back in this past year mm -hmm. you know we're still harvesting right now mm -hmm. we're still you know having our um classes you know trying to still maintain um our up with our language classes and stuff mm -hmm. so we're still trying to do all of those efforts yeah for more information about the gaiokono community you can go to friends of gaiokono.org that's friends of gaiokono g-a-y-o-g-o-h-o-n-o dot org friends of gaiokono g-a-y-o-g-o-h-o-n-o dot org uh, you can also go to the GoFundMe campaign, which is Help Cayuga Traditionalist Rebuild. That's under the GoFundMe site, gofundme.com, and then Help Cayuga Traditionalist Rebuild. And once again, thank you for listening to this podcast. Uh, you can find my, more stories uh, at my website, which is jleeming.com, J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G.com. Uh, take care, and may we all be awake to the stories living in the earth, uh, beneath our feet and around us in the smells and the sights and the birds and the stones and the rivers and the rain. Take care and be well. <laughs>